material to say this is how Turks were, were uh, depicted in that time. You need to have comparative material in order to be able to say that these, these, are Turks, pe- these people look like Turks. Turks. You can't say they look like Turks. Have we, have we got the right page open? No, no, no I'm not. Okay. I'm about to say something else to prove you can't do that. You'd also have to have um, some kind of written material to suppose there were Turks there, given that if there were Turks there, that would be noteworthy. There mm-hmm. is no written material, there were Turks there. And there wouldn't have been any Turks there anyway, because this is pre-Crusades. So this is before the Normans come into contact with the, with the Turks. Now, there will be points where the Turks uh, are in contact with Normans and could be serving in their armies, but 1066 and the depictions of it aren't that. that. And similarly, you would just have to look at these things and say, look, Saxons are really teeny tiny people compared with Normans. If all you do is look at a picture and draw a modern conclusion from the way the people in that picture are, are depicted. Mm. So, listen to me. Listening. You are surprised that the Pope bans crossbows. Um, it, it was learning that I got from Nick Austin that I really value. Now, generally, the uh, Popes have been opposed to war, opposed oh. to weapons of mass destruction, mm-hmm. opposed to um, uh, new weapons being uh, brought in and deployed. I forgot in the Popes used to have power, though. As heads of the... Well, they, they, no, yeah. they, they no more had power then than they do now were respected more. What, what, no, what, how no, would you describe no, not it? not at all. They're no more... What, what, res- why, did, why did it matter? Paul, oh, will you shut up and listen? <laughs> They're no more respected now than they were then. They're no more respected then than they were now. They had no more power. They had the power to say, as heads of this Christian religion, we believe that this Christian religion says you shouldn't be fighting. They instituted a system called the, the Truce of God, where they said no Christians should be fighting each other. They... Definitely mustn't fight on on saints' days, on Sundays. They mustn't fight without good cause. They mustn't fight just because they're vendettas or because they want to fight. You've got to stop doing those things. Uh, They didn't want new weapons to be brought in. So I'm not 100% sure on which side of the Battle of Hastings the crossbow debate comes in. But with a crossbow, you could more or less guarantee to kill a man secretly. So you could just go and murder somebody with a crossbow. It's very different from a, a, a longbow, which has a hunting purpose and could, in the context of lots of people at war, be used to kill somebody. It's a very, very different thing. It's as different as... Am I supposed to, to nod have, or say I haven't no, actually no, understood being, that point? Being allowed to keep a, a, a shotgun or being able to uh, keep a machine gun. And you wouldn't find it odd that the Pope might say, it's all right for people to have shotguns. But I, people shouldn't have machine guns. I get that. It's a good comparison, yeah. What we're thinking of, possibly, going on in your mind, is soon after the Battle of Hastings, the popes began to traduce all of that. So traduce in common parlance? Uh, they over t- they, they uh, perhaps betray that kind of common sense idea of what a pope ought to do. So when they start getting into the Crusades, they start to start coming up with reasons why you might be fighting why he might want to have kind of weapons because the crusades have changed the way for four or five hundred years in which the papacy reacted to the warriors of western europe so instead of in 1066 saying we want to stop the warriors of western europe fighting they then move we want them to fight particular enemies in particular ways particular reasons like we've asked them to do it and we're looking at here... And, and out of that developed the tiny Crusades. Yes. So what we're looking at here is a tipping point where half the protagonists care what the Pope says and half of them don't. So the English don't care what the Pope says. They've got their own Archbishop, who's got nothing to do with the, with the Pope, who appears on the Bayer Tapestry as uh, Stigand. They don't care the Pope's told them they're not allowed to fight. They're down well fighting. They're fighting the uh, Welsh. They're fighting the uh, Norse invaders. They intend to fight these people. William the Conqueror says, I actually believe everything Pope Alexander says. I totally agree with that. I'm going to fight exactly like he says. Um, here's the reasons. This guy's an oath breaker. You know, he swore an oath on some relics. You know, that's terrible. He did that in a church. You definitely should go fight. So the Pope gives his banner to William the Conqueror to say, Mm -hmm. that is right. In terms of Christianity, this guy is fighting the right way and those people fighting the wrong way. Now, the victory of William the Conqueror, the Battle of Hastings, is going to go quite a long way to strengthening the moral authority of the Pope to say when you're allowed to fight and when you're not allowed to fight. Ah, so God was on William the Conqueror's side. Pretty clear. Now... If there's any connection between the Pope and God. They made a bold assertion on the, ter- on the programme that this, this uh, 
tapestry is probably made on the, at the behest of Bishop Odin Bayer, who appears many times in the tapestry. They said it was propaganda that showed him fighting on the battlefield, even though there was no evidence he fought on the battlefield. But there is, in fact, nothing in the Bayer tapestry to suggest that he fought on the battlefield. It says, here, Bishop Odo, carrying a staff, brings comfort to our boys. And there he is, he's going in a different direction from the rest of the guys. He's going, turn back, turn back, go on the battlefield. Now, he hasn't got any weapons, he's got a staff of command. He is armoured because he's in the middle of a battlefield. But it doesn't show him playing a significant fighting part in the Battle of Hastings. It shows him bringing comfort to the troops, which is what he's been doing all the way through the, through the story. Just to put that into context. There are no figures carrying crossbows in the whole of the Bayo Tapestry. All of the people... Because that's what was showed, yeah, as, as, as something that has been are changed. carrying the same self -bowing. Nick Austin says it's something to do with the way in which they're holding them or something that doesn't look like a normal archery. No, you are right. Um, there is a book called The Great War Bow, uh, which does look at the, uh, the artistic conventions. In reality, the arrow would be on the other side of the bow. So uh, you, mm. you, would, you would have the uh, arrow on the outside of the bow being fired across the arm. There. And are these all on the inside? But it's very no, common, okay. yeah, it's very common artistic convention that the arrow is the last thing put in and because of the way that it's constructed, it's done as a continuous line. So it's, not, it's, not, a it's, not, it's no, not a restitch. It's not. It's not a restitching or anything. It's just an artistic convention, and and you also see the same thing in paintings. So they paint the guy with the bow, and then the last thing they paint, paint is the is the arrow, and so the arrow appears on the inside of the bow, not on the outside of the bow. Let's go to the biggest one of and all. Probably the guys, the uh, women who sewed this, had no idea how the bows worked anyway. Talking of arrows, can we go to the biggest myth of all? The arrow in Harold's eye. Yeah, this is an interesting question. It was quite interesting that they pointed out that earlier version of him holding a spear because there is a line of stitches going on here which carries on the line of a spear and this guy who is holding a spear has got his hands in exactly the same position as this guy. Mm. Uh, this guy has got the name Harold written over his head and so it's taken that this is a picture of Harold. Whereas Nick Austin takes it that, that he is, Har is um, Harold. It's possible that both of these people are Harold, but if we believe Nick Austin and this guy is Harold, you will also see that this man originally did have an arrow put through his eye there. Wow. You can see the stitches of it running so, into his eye. So, now, so, so it's, it's like uh, so the next possibly frame. At so, yes, at some time someone decided that that was Harold and that wasn't but Harold. Very odd comic convention to overlap the frames with the horse or something. I mean, how, what, can you comment on how you can tell what follows what in the, by a mm, tapestry? No, you can't, you can't tell that. Uh, the, 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 is the wording supposed to guide you as to where one frame ends and the next frame begins? or something? Uh, yes, I suppose so, in which case we would read that frame as, as starting there. But this word, hick, suggests that that's the start. That's here. Hick, Harold, Rex, in defect, so that that is the extent of, a, of the frame. But obviously every single element overlaps that frame. Mm. And that's standard through the... So they're not thinking of... Um, uh, they're thinking of it being continuous like a film mm -hmm. rather than a, a set of comic. Yeah, they never they never had books that they fly